Good morning and welcome to Hood Memorial Christian Church. We are glad that you are here. As Joni calls us to worship today, I invite you to still your soul in the presence of our Lord and Savior on this first Sunday of Advent. gather here in the presence of God and one another here in a sanctuary on Facebook on a conference call we gather to prepare the way for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to come in to the world yet again this year and brothers and sisters make no mistake that in 2020 we need Jesus Christ more than we ever have The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Advent means waiting. We have walked in darkness. And we are waiting for the great light. We have experienced deep darkness. And we are waiting for the light to shine, to make our path more clear. So in the act of hanging of the greens today and listening to the words of, of the prophets and the seers, let us make our hearts and this space a place of inward and outward preparation for the one who comes to give us second birth. The people of Israel cried for God to come and be with them. We make that plea, our prayer, as we enter this time of waiting for Emmanuel, God to be with us. Hear our prayer, O Lord.
people of God, pay attention. Pay attention even as you enter the church, at the church's entrance. Because we stand at the doorway of the Christian year. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Let us mark the entrance of the church building and our hearts and minds as portals for Christ to enter. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, reads the 24th Psalm, that the ruler of glory may come in. Who is this ruler of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Psalm 24 was used as the people went and traveled on their pilgrimage up to the temple. Once people entered into the temple, they looked to God to enter that temple, that space, that sanctuary, and join them in presence. Today, on this first Sunday of Advent, we, as Israel, along with their words through this 24th Psalm, look to meet the presence of God in this place. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory, the king of glory, may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord is the ruler, the king of glory. There are references in our scripture to God's love being evergreen. A constant and always there. God's love, loyalty, and faithfulness never fade away. They are not seasonal. From Hosea, hear these words. I will heal my people's disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. O oh, Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. Your faithfulness comes from me. Those who are wise understand these things. Those who are discerning know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. So today, as we remember God's faithful and steadfast love, those evergreens, we hang wreaths and garlands around the sanctuary to remind us that even when we stray from God's faithfulness, on every moment of every day, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, God's faithfulness remains. For God is one with all integrity and all power who makes us and redeems us this day and every day as we come to him in love and thanksgiving. God, the Holy One, is a God of comfort and compassion. With the Christmas tree, we remember God's everlasting promises to the poor and needy. Isaiah spoke of God's making of the wilderness, a place of blessing where water and plants would manifest God's loving action to save and provide. Even in the most barren of places of our lives, God is ever present. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is one, and their tongue is parched with thirst, 
I, the Lord, will answer them, say the prophet in Isaiah 41. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valley. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive trees. I will set in the desert the cypress, the pl- in the plain, the pine, together, so that all may see and all may know, all may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Today, we prepare this sanctuary for the coming of the Lord. Together, we will remember his advent, his birth in Bethlehem, weak and helpless as an infant. And here we rekindle our prayer and our plea. Come, Lord Jesus. We await his coming as the bright and morning star. We hang symbols and signs of Christ, our ruler, our king, our prophet, our priest, our healer, our physician, our beloved. We hang stars and crosses. We hang angels and triangles, the alpha and the omega symbols. All to remind us of Jesus' identity, that he is the beginning and he is the end. That he is our king, that his story is our story. Symbols that remind us of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All of this is to point us to Jesus Christ. I promised you over these four weeks of Advent that this year we would look to something that's been here that we so often have taken for granted. Well, maybe you all haven't. Sometimes it's easy to forget it's here. And over these past eight or nine months as we have been uh, outside and worshiping in God's creation, we have sometimes forgotten the beauty that has been in this room for, well, almost a hundred years now. Long ago, Some saints of this congregation, I don't think any of them would be living today. You'd have to be over 100 years old um, and to remember it probably more like 110 or 15 or 20. But matriarchs and patriarchs here in our community in Dunn took it upon themselves to tell the story of God, not just through words, but through image. And so these stained glass windows were placed in this sanctuary around us, not simply to shine in some pretty colors, not simply to look pretty, but to tell a story. And in every window, there is a story to tell. And over the years, uh, we have looked at windows and we've thought and we've reflected about those windows together and looked at what the meaning and the symbolism of the images in each of these windows might be. We don't have the artists alive today, so we can't ask them everything specifically, but we can look and we can think and we can reflect because that is what these windows were designed for us to do. And so during Advent, we turn to the Nativity window, a window that is featured prominently in this sanctuary. And I invite you, just turn around and look at it with me this morning. As you gaze upon the window, each week I want to point out A new little detail to you. Something that maybe you have noticed, maybe you haven't noticed. Today I want to start. And I want to invite you to just look at each face for a moment. I want to invite you to look specifically at the eyes of each character in the window. And if you can tell where those eyes are, are gazing. Can you see it? Mary, Joseph, a shepherd with the sheep on his back, a shepherd with a crook in his hand, 
two other men, potentially possibly shepherd, maybe we'll look at that more later, uh, one in green and one in red, who are kneeling, ones whose hands are folded, looking, and the other whose hands are sort of positioned outward, not sure what to make of the experience. Where are all their eyes? Anybody? Gazing upon the Christ child. I don't think that's coincidence, you know? Even look, you can see in the background, the star is shining down, and there is a cow and a horse or a donkey right back there. You can even look at their eyes, and even their eyes, the animals' eyes, are gazed upon the Christ child. All eyes pointed towards that central Christ child with the halo around his head reminding us of his divinity, with his frail human skin exposed. Notice how Mary's holding the the blanket off of him to show him to everyone in the scene a reminder that he is also fully human. Every eye gazed upon the Christ child. And during Advent, that is a reminder for every one of us. We are to look upon the Christ child, to gaze yet again. However far we might have drifted from our gaze upon Jesus over the course of the year, however weak or frailing our relationship might have come to over the past year, However we might have forsaken Jesus, however we might have praised Jesus wonderfully in celebration and thanksgiving, wherever we are, Advent is a time to remind us to set our gaze upon Jesus Christ. Human and divine. One who accomplished far more than any of us could hope to. We are to look to that one and to follow his lead yet again in this coming year. Yeah, that's right. This is the new year. Happy New Year. The Christian year begins today. And we start off this new Christian year by turning to Jesus Christ from the moment that he came into the earth. Setting our gaze upon his life, upon his teaching, upon his ministry. Both human and divine, Jesus comes to us to show us how to live to show us how to love, to show us what salvation means, that it's not simply something for me, but that it's something for all creation. And I have a feeling that's why the animals are at the manger scene, right? This is not just about humans. It's about all of God's creation. The sky, the star, the plants, the animals, things animate and things inanimate. It's about every person. And you can notice in the picture, the youngest is the Jesus Christ child. The oldest is probably the man in green who kneels with his hands bent. You can see his white hair and his white beard. Every age range is represented in that picture. And yet all eyes are fixed upon Jesus. Except one. You know there had to be an exception, right? Now, this is a little bit of a trick question. If you're looking at the window like, wait, 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 who's not looking at Jesus? The sheep's looking at Jesus. The cow, the donkey, yeah, they're all looking at Jesus. The shepherds that are standing, yeah, they're, they're looking at him. The ones who are kneeling, yeah, they're looking at him. Joseph, holding his hands together in the background, he's looking upon his son, Jesus. Mary is gazing at her son. It looks like all eyes are focused on him, right? Well, you know good and well just as I do, that you can't look at yourself unless you've got a mirror. So where is Jesus looking? Now, I took the little picture, the picture that I have of the window here on my iPad, and I gazed at it a long time last night. I'm trying to to pull it up here again for you. I gazed at it a long time last night, trying to just determine exactly where Jesus was looking. And on first thought, on first thought, I said to myself, well, he's kind of looking this way. Maybe he's looking at the gentleman who's kneeling in red here. Perhaps that's it. I thought and I thought and I looked and I said, I'm just not sure. It looks like he's not quite looking at that guy, but but maybe he is, and so I said, maybe my eyes are just deceiving me. Let me ask Joni. So I turned over to Joni. I said, Joni, 
Just tell me, where is Jesus looking? Joni looks at the, at the picture. She thinks for a minute. She says, well, honestly, it sort of looks like he's looking at the guy in red, but honestly, it looks like he's looking past him. I say, yes, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing too. It's like the Christ child isn't quite looking at the guy in red. He's looking sort of past him and out of the picture. But, but I thought to myself, so is he looking at us? But if you look at his eyes closely, they're not staring straight out. They're not staring straight out at you and me. They're still tilted off to the side just a little bit, not on the guy in red, but somewhere between straight ahead and the guy in red. So I thought, well, gosh, wait. so he's just looking at into space. And Joni said, yeah, that's that baby stare. You know, newborns, they can't really see much beyond their face. That's just the baby stare because you can't see they can't see in the distance yet. Their sight is not developed enough. And I said, yeah. I said, y- y- that, might, that might be it. I thought to myself for a minute. And I thought, but you know what? This window was placed in a room. This window was placed in a sanctuary. And it was designed with an artist's skill and intention. The artist would have known where the window was going to be placed. The artist would have known the layout of the sanctuary and designed the window to speak to this place, to this space, to every moment in our lives as we gather in here. So when you look at the Christ child and you think to yourself, okay, well, then he's looking not straight out. If he was looking straight out, he'd be looking right across at the Mary Martha window, right? He'd be looking at us, us all sitting out in the pews. But he's not. He's looking He's looking almost at me, to be honest, and maybe that's the thing I should take from us is beware, (laughs) no matter what you say from this pulpit, Jesus is looking at you. But I think there's something more than that, and that may be part of it, don't get me wrong. That may be part of it, and it's something I'll take to heart. But in this church, in our holy tradition, the Christian church disciples of Christ, we have a practice that is holy, that is sacred, that we come to each week, every time we gather in this place. And that is the table. The table upon which we sit the cup and the bread, which is the body of Christ. And if you look at Jesus' eyes, His eyes are fixed upon this table. Knowing in that moment, even as an infant, in some kind of divine way that there was more to come. That life would turn to bread and to wine. Symbols of a body that would be broken. Symbol of a life that would be poured out in overflowing love for each one of us. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. The artist could have depicted Jesus looking up at his mother Mary. Could have depicted Jesus looking up at God above, pointing us to look to to God, right? But this artist depicted this Christ child looking at the table of grace where we come each week in and each week out to meet that child yet again. On this Advent, we are reminded as the figures in the window show us, to fix our eyes upon Christ. We are also reminded that Christ has His gaze fixed on the cross. The cross as represented through His body and blood poured out at the table of grace. That symbol, yes, it's about death and resurrection. Sure, absolutely. But that symbol is also so much about being filled, being sustained, being fed and nourished. You see, Christ came absolutely to save us from our sins through his death and through his resurrection. Amen and amen. Christ also came to this world to teach us a new way to live. And whenever we forsake that way, whenever we forget the stories of old, Whenever we, like those sheep that those shepherds are tending, stray from the flock, Jesus is there again to remind us 
of a way of living that is about love and sacrifice and mercy and grace and thanksgiving. A way that points all the world to the one who made the world. Not at yourself because of an ego or because of what you've done or accomplished, but through you and past you to God above. That is the way that Christ calls us to, a way of humility. Everything, every eye in that window that is set in this building for 97 years, 96 years now, I think 23 or 24 was when it was set in place. We're a little fuzzy on the dates from our historical records exactly when the windows went in. But we know the building went in in 23 and 24. Every eye has reminded this family of faith for 96 years to fix our gaze upon the Christ child. And here again, 96 years after it was set in that window, pain. We gather again to remember this season of Advent to prepare our lives, to prepare our minds, to prepare our hearts, to prepare our souls by fixing our gaze upon the Christ child, upon his way, upon his teaching, upon his ministry, upon his miracles, upon his words, upon his actions. knowing that those actions fill us and sustain us and save us just as the body and blood of Christ sustain us. In this sanctuary, we have all kinds of other symbols that we have placed around and about us that remind us of Jesus' story. You can look at the other windows and see other stories. You can look upon the poinsettias and be reminded of the story that they tell. You can look at the Christmas tree and each ornament, for each ornament tells a story, a sign, a teaching, a symbol of God and Jesus and the Spirit. You can look at the nativity scene. There's one to my left and then there's one up here uh, to, to my right. Well, it's, you're right if you're looking out here anyway. You're right. Look at the story that the nativity scenes tell. Look at the story of the Advent wreath. We're going to hear the first bit of that story today as Mary Kay comes up to share it with us. From the blooms of the poinsettias to the star on the tree to the creche, we're reminded of all the many characters that are a part of this holy season that lead us to the humble birth of our one true King. I invite you for a moment to still your heart, to still the words in your mind, to set them aside, and just pick an image, just pick a symbol in this room. Allow it Allow its message, allow its story to fill your heart. And Mary Kay, when you're ready, you can come forward and lead us. As we begin to celebrate in the first week of Advent, this week is all about hope. Think about that as I read this scripture from Lamentations 3, 21 through 24. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in the Lord.
you join your heart with mine in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, as the season of Advent begins, we cry out to you. We turn our eyes towards your Son, towards you, our Father, our Holy Mother, our Holy Spirit. And we look today for hope. When everything else we rely on fails us, we turn again to you for our only hope is in you. When we do not understand what has happened in the world around us, we turn to you. We hope in you. We can hope for better days because we trust in you. We know you and we know you are here with us no matter what we are facing, no matter where life turns us towards. Some of us have been looking out over these past months and we see darkness. Some of us get to this time of year, Lord, when the seasons change and the weather turns cold and the days are short and the nights are long. And we see too much darkness. Others of us look out around us, and we find life overwhelming. We see light and life everywhere around us. We see people being creative and innovative. We see the message, your message, being shared yet again in new ways. An old, old story in words that folk today can understand. Most of us, God, are probably somewhere between the two. Between seeing overwhelming darkness and overwhelming light. And we find ourselves swinging perhaps back and forth as a pendulum. God, wherever we find ourselves today, remind us to turn our gaze, to fix our eyes upon you as the source of our life, as the source of our great love, as the source and the sustenance of all we do. Remind us again, Lord, that our hope is in you. God, as we set off on this journey of Advent today, be our guide. Walk with us. Carry us along the way when our feet get too feeble. Wrap your arms around our shoulders as a loving friend and companion. God, be with us. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for.
And so as Jesus' eyes remind us in the nativity window, we come again today to the table of grace. To be filled, to be fed, to be nourished, to receive into us something that we, on the one hand, think of as a symbol of Christ's grace and mercy. And on the other hand, we know through experience that what we receive into our bodies is grace and mercy in a very real sense. Brothers and sisters, we are all invited to this table. The Christ child beckons us to come. No matter where we are in any walk of life, no matter whether you're sitting at home watching on Facebook today or listening in through our conference call or sitting here in this very room, Christ wants you to come to his table and be fed. So wherever you are and whatever you have brought with you, and if you're here and you didn't bring anything with you, there are some on the back window right beneath the Christ child. You can go pick that up. Lee's going to come forward and is going to pray for us over the body and over the bread and over the wine and over the blood. I invite you to still your heart and join your heart with Lee's as he leads us this morning. Thank you, preacher. And I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. We've already been talking about this beautiful sanctuary today and the windows that are here. And, and when I think about this church, I think, you know, about, yeah, we're small in numbers, but we're so big in heart. Amen. And I, to put it in just my terms <laughs> it's this church is like a 12 foot john boat with a 150 yami on it <laughs> it's a great feeling and i hope you feel the presence of god in this room because he is here and i hope that if you're watching that you feel that same presence you know jesus came to us as a baby god came wanted to come down and be with us so he, he comes down and he's born in a barn and perhaps the first things he sees besides his mother and father is hay and dirt a cow a sheep a goat <laughs> you talk about humble beginnings right so, and that, that's, that's the lesson to us, to be humble. Now, the really cool thing is that we know the end of the story. And that's what we celebrate right here at this table. When we, when we take the bread, we're celebrating the broken body of Jesus. Now, we couldn't have gone through what he went through. And then when we talk about and we drink the wine, we're drinking the spilled blood of Jesus, our brother. And he did this so that we can live life abundantly and be happy. So praise God, praise this church, and praise everyone out there. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. After 30 some years of ministry, the one who was born as a small child, born from God, yet born as a human gathered into a room with his disciples, those men and women of faith who had been following him throughout his ministry here on earth, those folks who had seen the miracles, who had heard the stories, who had tried their best to understand the teachings. In other words, folk just like you and me. 
gathered in that room. And just as the shepherds did in the manger, they set their eyes upon Jesus again as he took a loaf of bread and broke it and blessed it and said to them, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, set your gaze upon me yet again. Today as we eat together, we remember and we fix our eyes on Christ. Let us eat. After taking the bread, Jesus picked up a cup nearby. No doubt his cup was a little bigger than mine. And he poured it out for each of those brothers and sisters around the table as they continued to gaze at him. And he said again, this is my life poured out for your life. This wine is a symbol of my blood that will be spilt, that has been spilt for you because of love. Jesus took upon himself something that he didn't want you to have to take upon yourself just as a mother does for her son, just as a father does for his daughter. Jesus blessed the cup, the juice in it, the wine in it. He distributed it, and he said, whenever you drink of this, set your eyes upon me. And so today, as we drink together, we again fix our eyes upon Christ. Join me. I don't know where life will take you this week. No doubt the Christmas season is here and it's in commercials and it's on TV screens and movies. It's on the sights and sounds around you and done and uh, and Irwin and Lillington and Andrew and all throughout our county. It's going to be in every store that you go to shop in this week. It's going to be on every website that you visit, on every Facebook post that you look at. I hope it'll be in some books that you read, perhaps. I invite you that no matter where the world points you, that where the world tries to pull your gaze, that you will remember to fix it upon Christ. As the window reminds us, as the table reminds us, as the season of Advent compels us to prepare the way for the Lord. I pray that one of your responses this week will to be to give and to give generously to the mission and to the ministry of this church family. As we come to the end of our calendar year and our fiscal year, we look back and we begin to consider what all we have done, how we have ministered to folks throughout this community over the previous year, and we look forward towards the next year of mission and ministry right here in the very heart of downtown Dunn, one of the few churches that can still say that we're here in the heart of downtown Dunn. Your giving empowers this family of faith to share this story of Christ, to share the Advent story, to share the Christmas story, to share the Easter story, to go out and feed folks at a table just as Christ feeds us at this table. Your gift empowers us to reach out to the broken and the brokenhearted, sharing a message of love and salvation and forgiveness and restoration you have an opportunity every week to help support that mission and ministry. Not only through your tithes and your offerings, but through your presence. 
and through your prayers and through your service. Sometimes it's inside these walls and downstairs in the kitchen or a fellowship hall or out in the parking lot. Sometimes it's across the street and down the road and around the state. Wherever it is, I pray that as Christ looks to the table, that you will look to the table around us to how you can serve someone else. There are baskets on the folks' way out. Is that right, Joni? All from plates on the way out. Uh, so as you leave, if you would like to give a gift today, uh, as you leave, you can just drop it in. We won't pass them around, but they're on your way that you can drop it into on your way out in just a few minutes. Before you leave, I want to invite you to receive a blessing, a benediction, a good word from the Lord. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift her countenance upon you and make you whole. May our God, through his Son Jesus Christ, transform you this day through the renewing of your mind, and may God's Spirit fill you with joy and with love and with Advent hope that you might live each day in harmony with one another. And may the peace of Christ, the peace of a child born into a manger, a peace that surpasses our understanding, may it guard your hearts, your minds, and your souls through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you join me and you can stand and reach out your hands whether you're at home or whether you're here in the building today as we sing our closing church song, We Are Family. in hope.